In this chapter, we are going to focus our attention on the manufacture of fats and oils, the functions of lipids in food products, and the selection of lipids based on those functions. As varying fats and oils behave differently when cooking with them, we need to have a better understanding of how they function so that when we start to manipulate the formulas, we will have a better idea of what might happen. So go ahead, open up your textbooks and turn to page 184. Pull out your writing utensil and the note pages that you have downloaded off of D2L and we're going to go ahead and get started. On page 184 in your textbook, there is an excellent graphic of the manufacturing of food fats. First, fats are extracted from animal tissue by the process called rendering. Um, in rendering, essentially, the fat of the animal is uh, melted and then it is solidified, taking care to control the size of the crystals. This is the process in which lard is made as well as beef tallow. Fats and oils extracted from plant products um, happen with a solvent being added to the nut or the seed or the plant tissue, and then that mixture is heated and crushed. This process is called pressing, and there is an excellent video in D2L on the pressing of olives to make olive oil. So please take a few minutes to, to watch that video. After the fat has been extracted, the fats and oils then are refined to remove contaminants that could increase deterioration. The refining processes tend to increase the smoke points and lighten the color of the oils. Different processes include degumming, which removes the gums through steam or the use of a dilute phosphoric acid. Neutralizing procedures remove free fatty acids through the use of steam. Bleaching removes undesirable coloring and flavoring contaminants via filtering with charcoal. Deodorizing uses steam distillation to remove low molecular weight aldehydes, ketones, peroxides, and free fatty acids that greatly alter the aroma or flavor of fats. This process is helpful in lessening the oxidative rancidity in soybean oil, but would be very inappropriate in olive oil as we prize olive oil for its flavor. The final refining process is winterizing. And in winterizing, uh, fatty acids are removed if they have melting points high enough to cause them to become solid at refrigerator temperatures. Winterized oils are used in salad dressings and other pourable sauces because we do not want salad dressings to solidify when we hold them in the refrigerator. Olive oil is not winterized as it would negatively affect the flavor of the olive oil. Two more processes that happen then as we are manufacturing our food fats. Uh, we have fractionation, which is the process of separating oils into fractions using controlled temperatures to crystallize the fatty acids based on melting point. Those lipid fractions with a high melting point tend to be more saturated in the trans configuration. So we can separate out those fractions, not use those, and use the unsaturated cis fat oils to make, to make our vegetable oils that we are most familiar with. The final phase then is to control the crystallization of the warm fluid fat. Just as in candy making, we want to control the size of the crystals by cooling the fat uh, with agitation to keep those crystals small. If we cool too rapidly, the lipid will have large coarse crystals with a grainy feel. Tempering 
is the process in which the temperature is very carefully controlled during crystallization of fats. Um, those fats that are used in candy making are tempered. Um, tempering produces a more stable crystal. Therefore, the likelihood of bloom or this grayish granule area here on the piece of chocolate on the screen, um, it controls the bloom. It lessens the, it lessens the risk of bloom happening on the chocolate. Fats and oils can go through several chemical modifications once they are extracted. The first one I want to talk about is hydrogenation. And this is the addition of hydrogen to points of unsaturation to make oil more saturated and thus solid at room temperature. It alters the melting points of the fatty acids by increasing their saturation with hydrogen. Hydrogenation increases the plasticity saturation and the amount of trans fat. Fully hydrogenated oils do not contain double bonds, so therefore there's no trans fats formed. However, fully hydrogenated fats are too hard. Um, they, are not, they are not plastic. So many times we will see partially hydrogenated oils, such as what we have here on the label on the bottom of the screen. These partially hydrogenated oils are more plastic, but they can also contain trans fat, as you can see there on the label as well. So the hydrogenation process is how shortening and margarines are made. There is a video clip in D2L on the hydrogenation of vegetable oils. I recommend that you stop this presentation, take a moment to view that video on hydrogenation that then will help to make more sense of the content in future slides. A second chemical modification is interesterification. And this is the treatment of fat where the fatty acids are removed from the glycerol backbone and rearranged to form a more homogeneous structure that allows for smaller crystal size and a higher melting point. New triglycerides are formed with the shifting of the fatty acids. This process is sometimes used to produce shortenings in margarines without forming trans fats. The final chemical modification is intraesterification, which is very similar to interesterification, but the fatty acids attach to different positions on the same glycerol backbone. Now flip to page 193 and look at table 9.2. Notice all of the different types of lipids that are available for use. Think about some of the different animal-based fats that are available. You can look there at the table and you can see that we have milk fat or butter fat that's found in the dairy products beef tallow, which is melted beef fat, um, and then lard, which is melted fat from pigs. Overall, these fats tend to be higher in saturated fat. They um, can be solid at room temperature, especially the beef tallow and the lard is very obvious. And since they come from animal products, they do contain cholesterol. Now, if we look at the plant-based fats, you can see there that they are, many are vegetable-based. Um, sometimes the plants can be genetically modified to produce oils with no trans fats, um, and that can make them more suitable for frying. Finally there, we have got the plant sterol or plant stanol such as the Tate Control brand or Benicol. And these are fats that prevent the absorption of LDL or the bad cholesterol. These fats are not appropriate for baking, but they do taste really good on a piece of whole wheat toast in the morning. 
There is a short video clip in D2L on how the plant sterols and stanols are made. I believe it's about a minute. So if you want to stop, take a moment to review that video. I think it would be very helpful. Fats and oils in the marketplace continuing on. Um, there are so many that we can purchase. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes here and, and provide some information about four different categories of fats and oils that we can purchase. So first of all, shortening. Uh, shortening is made from vegetable oil that has been partially hydrogenated. Um, it is 100% fat. It is a plastic fat, so that means that it can be moldable. Um, this has great implications when making pie pastry and biscuits that we need to have that, that flakiness too. Plastic fats, such as shortening and lard, can be interchanged with very little effect on the baked product. Oils are 100% fat by weight, but they are liquid. Um, oils can be purchased as a single type, such as corn oil, or it can be a blend of a variety of oils. Um, there's a wide variety of oils available for purchase. I mentioned the corn oil. We've got canola oil, vegetable oil, olive oil, grapeseed oil, avocado oil, all sorts that we can choose from. When we have the flavored oils, we need to be mindful of that flavor and how that flavor might impact with the other flavors of the food product. Butter um, is a water and oil emulsion that is formed when milk fat is churned. Butter is 80% fat and about 16.5% water. Uh, butter has a very unique flavor. It is not plastic. Uh, when you pull it out of the refrigerator, it is very hard, uh, brittle almost. But it is, it is a solid fat. Margarine was designed to mimic the flavor of butter, but to not have cholesterol and to be, um, to be a more healthy fat different types of margarines that we have available. We have stick margarine, uh, soft margarine or tub margarine um, that has a higher water content than the stick margarine. And then the whipped margarine, which is increased in volume due to the incorporation of air. So therefore a whipped margarine is going to have fewer calories in the same given amount because there's air whipped into the whipped margarine. Margarine is still 80% fat with the some of the softer tub margarines having more of a, a higher water content, therefore making them not as appropriate for baking. When we think about substituting different types of fat, um, Maybe it's because we don't have a certain kind of fat in our home, or maybe we are looking to have a diet less in saturated fat or trans fat. Um, we're, we're looking for, more, for a more heart healthy fat. Um, there's different, um, different types of fats then that we can choose from. And what fat that we are wanting to substitute is going to depend on the function of the fat in that product. For example, if we are making, if we are making pie pastry, we need to think of the functions of fat in pie pastry as being flakiness and tenderness. So if we remove the shortening or the lard from the formula and replace it with a plant sterol or stanol, what can we expect to see? Okay, how is that going to impact the flakiness or the tenderness of our pie crust? We need to think about recreating the attributes of the fat. So if we are substituting, um, if we are substituting canola oil for olive oil, what implication is that going to have? 
okay? There's going to be changes in the flavor, but probably not changes in the tenderness. Um, the smoke points will be different. So if we were going to be using the olive oil for deep fat frying, which I would not recommend, um, but if we were, then we'd have to think of the smoke point and the canola oil would be the better choice there. There is not one ideal substitute. Um, so if we are exchanging an oil for a shortening, um, we're adding a liquid into the formula. And so we need, we need to consider that as well. The table 9.1 there on the bottom of your screen shows you the fat content in selected fats um, looking just at one tablespoon. So you can look across there and of course see that the, that the butter is the only one that contains cholesterol. And that makes sense because it comes from an animal fat. You can see great variation there in the trans fats as well as the total fat and the saturated fat. Our final topic for chapter nine is the discussion of the functions of lipids in food. From the slide, you can see that there are six different functions and we're gonna begin with color. So in the upper right-hand corner there, you see an image of butter and butter and margarine and some shortening such as the butter flavored Crisco have beta carotene added to mimic the color, to mimic the color of butter. Flavor is dependent on the type of fat. Um, if you think about it, um, olive oil and butter and lard all have different flavors. So uh, how many of you would rather dip your hard crusted bread into a mixture of olive oil and Parmesan cheese? And how many of you would rather slather butter onto that hard crusted bread? For me, I'm more of a butter gal. Fats influence different textural characteristics depending on the type of food considered. For example, the flakiness of pastries and biscuits require the use of a plastic fat, such as shortening or lard. The fine, delicate cell structure, such as what we see there in that luscious looking chocolate cake, needs a shortening with added emulsifiers which facilitate the creaming together of the fat and the sugar. And finally, the crispy fried foods that require a neutral flavored oil with a high smoke point. Fats and oils also act as tenderizing agents in baked products by interfering with the development of the gluten by coating the flour so it doesn't react with the water. The shortening power is the ability of a fat to cover a large surface area to minimize the contact between the water and the gluten during the mixing of different batters and doughs. Unsaturated fats, such as oils, have a greater shortening power, whereas the more solid saturated fats, so think butter, um, or those with a higher melting point, have only a moderate amount of shortening power. Plastic fats, such as shortening and lard, have a better tenderizing effect than the hard brittle butter. Given that shortenings are partially hydrogenated, they have a mix of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids and a somewhat lower melting point. So while the shortening doesn't flow, it is moldable or plastic, and it's plastic enough to coat the gluten and shorten the gluten strands to provide some tenderness to a product, such as a pie or a shortened cake. The next function of a lipid is that in emulsification. And an emulsion, if you will remember, is a dispersion of a liquid within another liquid in which it is not soluble. So these are two liquids that usually do not mix. The different types of emulsifiers that we commonly see in lipid-based products are the mono and diglycerides and shortening. So you can see that in the shortening label on the bottom right-hand corner. 
and then the lecithin in the egg yolks. And the, the label on the left-hand side is that for ice cream, and you can see there that the fourth ingredient is egg yolks. The final functional role of fats is as a cooking medium. Deep fat frying is actually a dehydration process as the intense heat of the oil evaporates the water in the food very quickly. As the water evaporates, heat is lost that helps to prevent the burning on the surface of the food. Frying heats to a higher temperature than when boiling or, or steaming with water. So this helps the foods to cook more quickly Fats make an excellent heating medium because of the high temperatures that they can be cooked without melting and without incurring any damage to the food. Fats ability to be heated to this much higher temperature than water provides for the crispy texture. Just like the type of fat matters when baking, the type of fat matters with, when frying. Oils with a high smoke point a neutral flavor and a reasonable cost are the ones best suited for frying. Butter and margarine are not good choices as they don't hold up well to the high heat. Plus the milk solids will brown and burn and the butter and margarine have a lower smoke point. Additionally, the water in the butter and the margarine promotes hydrolytic rancidity. So just, yeah, butter and margarine are not good choices um, for deep fat frying. Shortenings tend to have emulsifiers added, which lower the smoke point. Plus, shortenings break down fairly quickly. Oils tend to be best for frying, with different oils having different smoke points, flavors, and some are just really super expensive. Finally, we need to be concerned with the amount of fat that is, is absorbed into the food. Three factors that influence the amount of fat absorbed in a fried food include the temperature of the frying oil, the lower the oil or the lower the temperature of the oil, the more fat that it is, is absorbed due to the longer amount of time that the food is in the oil. Preheating the oil to 350 to 375 degrees Fahrenheit and not overloading the basket um, as that will lower the temperature of the oil are both important in, in moderating the amount of fat that it is, is absorbed. The second factor is the composition of the food fried. Foods that are higher in sugar and fat will absorb more fat. So just think for a minute how much fat is absorbed in one of those deep fat fried Oreos. Oh, I can only imagine. Finally, we have the age of the oil. Older oils tend to be absorbed more into the food than foods fried in fresher oils. If you haven't yet watched the Culinary Institute of America's frying video in D2L, I highly recommend that you take a moment to watch it as it explains deep fat frying very well. As we conclude chapter nine, please take a moment to read the chapter summary on page 207 and test your knowledge by answering the study questions four, seven, eight, and 10 through 15.